and welcome to another edition of Eclectic Moments. My name is Terry Elaine Scott Mitchell, and I'll be your host. Today we are very blessed to be in the presence of a gentleman who, who, whose introduction reads like a who's who. His name is Nigel Benz. Nigel Benz is best described as a 21st century Renaissance man who defies time and space. Nigel's name is a title that means the Black Prince of God. His list of accomplishments are timeless and are rooted in his African tradition and ancestry. He is an accomplished sculptor, painter, entrepreneur, stuntman, actor, motion picture fight, fight coordinator, and choreographer. He is also a martial arts instructor, writer, and author. Nigel is head of Nijart International and a master sculptor and craftsman of bronze statues. His classic Mother of Humanity bronze mo monument is a Los Angeles landmark. Nigel created the Mother of Humanity monument as a statement of global peace and a tribute to women and mothers around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, it is really my pleasure and honor to introduce our special guest today, Mr. Nigel Benz. Nigel, thank you so much for coming to the show. Oh, thank you for inviting me. It's a thank pleasure. I did quite a bit of research and quite a bit of reading on your work and your sculpture, articles, books, etc. But your work transcends time, truly. You deal with issues of the, the legacy lost of the African American in this country. Your reading and your work is extensive in our culture, and I want to begin at that place. I want to begin at the place where, if you will, slavery, the beginning of it, the demise of our culture here in America. And I'd like you to expound a little bit on that from your reading and your work. Hmm. Well, as you know, the Ma'afa, or the event of uh, slavery, had a devastating effect upon Africans in America. And um, as a result of that, we still are feeling a lot of the repercussions of that even today. So when we look at um, the discontinuity of our culture, mm -hmm. uh, when we look at why we're not progressing in ways that reflect our glorious past, then we have to deal with the issue of slavery and deal with it uh, to realize that, yeah, the effects are still with us. And my work as a historian and as a sculptor uh, works to heal that process, uh, to bring it up to present day so we could all understand it and know where we've been and therefore know where we're going in the future. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, even in today's media and in uh, the things that we hear on television today, there's still a very strong racial divide, not just in this country, but, but in the world at large. And I, I think that this work that you uh, have done and will do uh, will be a great instrument in, in that healing. Yeah, I, I hope so. I certainly do. Let's talk a little bit about, when we talk about history, one of the components that I read in your work was the impact of the, the tenure, if you will, of the Moors. Mm -hmm. I'd like you, if you would, to elaborate a little bit about their, their seizing of the area, Spain, yes. and then the impact yes. that that had yes. on culture forward. All right. Well, you know, the 800-year period of the Moors' rule in Spain, 800 years is a long time, and I really can't cover all of that time in a, a brief moment as such now. But one of the most important things to know about the Moors when I uh, talk a little bit about them is that the development of Europe could not have happened without the time period that the Moors spent in Spain and the rest of Europe. In other words, when we look to European history and we know that there was a renaissance mm -hmm. and we know now we see the technological advances that they have made which in fact enabled the slave trade to become a reality none of those things would have happened if it were not for the African Moors who ruled Spain for that 800 year period so at the demise of that 800 year period which began in 711 AD uh, the technology was left in Europe that the Moors had accumulated. Mm -hmm. And that enabled them to have navigation and go around the, the planet. And that's the real advent of white supremacy. That's when that all began, mm -hmm. based upon the technology that was left behind when the Moors were expelled from Spain. How were they expelled? Um, there were continuous battles in Spain. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things, oddly enough, is that they had uh, um, indoor plumbing hot and cold running water, but they were running them through lead pipes. Mm -hmm. And as we all know, the effect of lead. 
is lead uh, poisoning. Is dangerous, exactly. Yes, I see. So over time, uh, with the constant battles that the Moors were uh, having to defend Spain, and also the technology that they themselves used, it caused their demise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. But that period, I don't want to um, underplay it, the period of the Moors in Spain was pivotal in terms of what Europe then came to inherit when the Moors left or were expelled. Share with us, share with us just a few of the, sure. the, well, the things well, that were left behind, if you will. Okay. Well, you know, we all talk about the university system today. We're all very proud when we get our master's degree, our you know, Bachelor of Science, our PhDs and so forth. But do you know that the Moors left 17 universities in Spain at the time when Spain and the rest of Europe had none at all? No. The Moors introduced the library system. They introduced a lot of the technologies, the sciences, and the arts into Europe. You know, um, irrigation. They had raised sidewalks that were lit by street lamps for miles. And we're talking about a time when the rest of Europe, they were emptying their excrement in pots outside their window. Mm -hmm. That's the extent of their technology. Mm -hmm. You know, you take a crap, what do you do? Dump it out the window. Okay. okay. The Moors had very sophisticated technology and had schools of learning. Um, and their women were scholars and physicians. They had things at level. If the Moors, let me just say this. Had the Moors been able to continue their legacy, mm -hmm. um, modern civilization would have been at least seven to eight hundred years more advanced than it is today. From the impact of, of, of the information and the knowledge that they had. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a, there's a, a, a flicker of a thing coming to my mind where when the Romans took over in Greece, the destruction of the literature. Oh, yes. And uh, I'm just wondering how, if there's any connection. Yes, there is. You know, it's interesting. Um, all the universities, all the libraries were burned, the books were burned, you know. That's when the Spanish Inquisition took place, by the way. So you had... What's that all about? Well, you know, fear of the knowledge. So believe fear. it or not. Yeah, fear. And believe it or not, you know, with the Moors, one of their things were they took baths frequently, just as an example. Mm -hmm. So the backlash of that was, well, now that the Moors are out, it is a sin... To take a bath. To take a bath. Oh, that's where that came from. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The stinky European. Pardon yeah. my French. Yeah. Got it. So it's, okay. it's a very important legacy mm -hmm. that we need to um, understand and be able to reclaim because we as African people were brilliant and still are, but we don't know that particular part of our history before the advent of slavery, mm -hmm. directly before. We don't have to go all the way back to ancient Kemet. Right. You know, this is happening right before Columbus set sail. Columbus would not have been able to set sail were it not for the Morse technology, the astrolabs, the navigation, the compass that the Moors left. Oh, and I thought he did all that. I thought yeah. he, it was all out of <laughs> his mind. Yeah. Just oh. the information about who we are yeah. and who we were is just not taught yes, in know. schools today. Um, the, the impact of, of what is going on in our communities in terms of where we came from couldn't be any more timely. Uh, I'd like to move further into, if this is where we were, this is where we're coming to, what kinds of things can we look for in terms of your vision for the future? How can we make changes so that mm. we can reclaim what we had, but also move forward? Well. What is the Nigel vision, if you will? My vision is based upon the visions and legacies of people who looked at this problem before I did and people who knew what the solutions were. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, we have people like Marcus Garvey, we have people like uh, Patrice Lumumba and Kwame Nkrumah. Um, we know that today the space shuttle cannot go up, satellites cannot be built, our computer chips, we would not have them mm -hmm. in our computers. Um, the hospitals when they use surgical steel tools, all of those things are only made possible not by the greatness of Europe, but by the raw materials and strategic materials that they in continue Africa. to take from the soil of Africa. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> you know, until we know that, that there's a connection there, mm -hmm. um, and, and I believe that my vision of the future is when we come to respect our natural resources, and not only in the soil, but the people, mm -hmm. you know, 
our resources in terms of ourselves, of ourselves. our own communities, our history, and those things are our resources. When we come to respect and understand that, then we can build on it. But we can't know where we're going if we don't know where we're from. Mm -hmm. And we've been taught to disconnect from Africa so well that we don't even know that modern conveniences today that we're enjoying is only made possible by the raw materials in the soil of Africa. Mm -hmm. So therefore, when the wars are destabilizing that continent, it is to keep us from ever making the connection. Exactly. I understand that you're in the process of, of uh, putting together something uh, like a school or a sculpturing a school or a, a foundry. Mm. Tell us a little bit about the vision that you have for that. Yes, well, you know, I am a sculptor, and in order for me to advance my work and employ the community, I need to find myself in a position to have a studio. Now, all the great artists had a studio to work with, and they were able to employ people in the community. Mm -hmm. Now, the largest piece I've done is 16 feet tall. That's a huge monumental piece. Exactly. But I need to do more of that. Exactly. You know, I've done life-size pieces as well. So my vision is, right here in the community, I'd like to find interested people who know the value of this type of art and will find with me a location to build a studio to employ our youth mm -hmm. to reconnect and develop these, uh, these icons of our culture once again. Very good. We're going to take a, a moment a break here, All Nigel, right. and we'll be right, right back. Okay. Over the past two decades, Nigel's sculptures have been commissioned by the Los Angeles Urban League. Fox Studios, Sony, and the Great Blacks in Wax Museum. Known as the Sculptor to the Stars, Nigel's masterworks are owned by Michael Jackson, Stevie Wonder, Natalie Cole, Jackie Chan, Nelson Mandela, Denzel Washington, Celia Cruz, and a growing list of luminaries. Nigel is a member of the National Sculptor Society. Nigel's work recently, Nigel's recent work as a professor, Nigel's recent work as a professional writer of BKF Kenpo, History and Advanced Strategic Principles, was released worldwide this year. In 1990, Nigel achieved international recognition by writing and publishing the book, Nuba Wrestling, The Original Art. It explores the ancient martial arts of Kemet, now known as Egypt, and is largely responsible for the global re-examination of the origins of martial arts, which we will indulge you with later. In 1998, Nigel presented his findings on the arts and entertainment television documentary, The Martial Arts, a narrative by Star Trek actor George Taki. Thank you so much. Nigel, I'd like to move further into some of the many things that you do. Sure. The first of which, you're an actor and a choreographer for films here in Hollywood yes. and worldwide. <laughs> Let's talk yeah. a little bit about your work with director Robert Klaus. Oh, yes. If you would, get a close-up. Yes. Well, you know, director Robert Klaus is best known for his work as the director of Bruce Lee's famous classic film, Enter the Dragon, mm -hmm. which I just took a look at again last night. I mean, that was made in 1974, and today it's still as exciting and vibrant as ever. Exactly. And Robert Klaus, a very dear friend of mine since 1974, mm -hmm. um, developed the film, uh, directed it, and uh, was actually in very instrumental in the start of my film career. Okay, I understand you work with. Uh, did you did you work with with wh what was the impact of Bruce Lee and his son in terms of your work in Japan? <sighs> Well, I mean, tell that story, if, if you would. Well, you know, w upon the death of Bruce Lee, that became my catalyst as a martial artist to want to become involved in the film industry. Okay. So um, I was in New Jersey at the time, and no way of getting to California, so I joined the Air Force. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> so people... Fly over. Well, you know, it was a, a gamble that kind of paid off. Okay. And uh, throughout my four years in the military, people were saying, you know, why are you trying to get into the film industry, but you're sitting in the, behind a desk here in the Air Force. It doesn't make sense. Okay. But I knew what I was doing. Mm -hmm. So throughout the four-year period, I made a lot of phone calls and connected with a lot of people. Chuck Norris, um, a good friend of mine before he became the Chuck Norris, and uh, Robert Klaus. And also I uh, befriended the Lee family. And at that time, um, uh, Linda Lee and her son and daughter were living here in California. Mm -hmm. So. You know, while I was not working, 
at my desk i was on the phone <laughs> making contacts uh, my last two years i was over in japan getting ready to go into the film career mm -hmm. so i found uh, myself in hong kong at the end of my time and at uh, golden harvest studios and that studio made bruce's major films mm -hmm. so that's where i wanted to go okay so i'm here in hong kong and they're looking at me telling me well you know hey i uh, maybe you wasted your time you know we here are making films and they were right you know for the chinese community and there are not a lot of black actors in hong kong mm -hmm. so i wasn't really too disheartened but uh, i told them well you know i know robert klaus and they didn't believe me this so they said well you know if you know robert klaus why don't you give him a call and maybe he could help you exactly so i said okay <laughs> so i called robert klaus <laughs> and um bob as i call him said well you know nigel um we're getting ready to make a film with this new Asian sensation and they think he's going to be really big and he's doing his first American film why don't you come on back to the States and maybe I can get you in and so I said yeah well who is this guy they said uh, a, a guy they call Jackie Chan so Just I said like okay that. sure so I came back to the States to San Antonio Texas where I started my military career four years full earlier circle. full circle back again and sure enough I was in Jackie Chan's first American film I'm in the theater scene. I have a fight scene with Jackie. Yes. And uh, that was in 1980. So those who thought I was crazy for the four years, they, when they saw me on screen, it's like, wait a minute, that hey, guy geez. did what he exactly. <laughs> said he was going to do. Exactly. So that was fun. And you worked with Robert Klaus on several, several productions. Yes, I uh, did. China O'Brien, right. uh, Jackie Chan again mm -hmm. in uh, The Big Brawl. Right. And uh, again in Force 5. Yes. So yes. now, you, you start out as an actor who does who does karate yes and then you you become so good that you begin to become the stunt coordinator right just talk a little bit about that yes well the technical term uh, for my starting is stunt man okay I wasn't really an actor at that time I was just a stunt man mm -hmm. so they needed somebody to get kicked here or get beat up here that was me with the guy yeah okay and uh, it developed from there uh, one of my big breaks towards becoming a fight coordinator was working with Pat Johnson, who was a veteran from Bruce Lee's early film, Enter, Enter the, the Dragon. Dragon. So working with Pat, Pat took me under his wing, and um, when they were doing Karate Kid 2, he called me in to fill in for him one day, and I became the assistant fight coordinator from that film. Okay. And when it came time to do the China O'Brien series, he recommended me for that lead position, so now I've got a crew of about 50 stunt guys that I'm actually doing. Telling them which way to go. Yeah, exactly. Fantastic. And, um, it was a great experience. And then again, of course, I was very comfortable because I was working with my good friend Robert Klaus, mm -hmm. the director. And you had worked with him for so on so many other projects. Yeah. Very good. Martial arts student, martial artist yourself. Um, how long did you study? I, I, since 1968 you've right. been involved? Right. I began in 1968 and I began training and teaching and that led to my teaching in the Air Force. I taught at Vandenberg Air Force Base as well as Kadena Air Force Base in Japan. Okay, very good. And I still continue training today. I have classes as well every day of the week. In your studio? Yes. Okay. Yes. Studio is located on Hoover. Right, it's at my home. 2131 right. in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. So anybody who's ready and up for the challenge, you teach, you teach the karate and what other disciplines as well? Um, Wing Chun a Chinese-based style that was developed by a Buddhist nun, as well as meditation and kickboxing. Okay. So it's a very well-rounded program. Exactly. And how long would it take a person who's diligent and, and uh, staying focused and disciplined in the work to go from, let's say, a beginner to a, an intermediate level? Uh, about a year. Okay. About a good year. Okay. You know, it does require discipline. Southern California, I found out, being from the East Coast, where you really focus in on what you're doing. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of distractions here in Southern California. Yeah, so the weather for one. <laughs> exactly. Yes. So uh, it really takes commitment. Okay. I'd like to move on into the area that, another area that you work in, which is as a writer and a yes. co-author. Yes. Uh, you co you writ you actually did the writing for this particular text. Yes. Nuba, Wrestling the Original Art. Mm. Tell us a little bit about what the original art is about. Well, you know, from my years of being a martial artist, I always wondered about where the martial arts began, and I began to see hints of things that I researched, and I proved conclusively 
beyond the shadow of a doubt, indisputable, irrefutable mm. fact okay. that the martial arts began in Africa. There's no one on the planet that could refute that information. That fact. Yes. Now, I wow. just happen to be the first person to document it in such great detail. Okay. I'm not the first person who uh, knew about that or even mentioned it. There are two well-known masters of the martial arts named Masoyama mm -hmm. and also Ed Parker. And in their first publications in the early 60s, they talked about the fact that the martial arts began in Africa. Okay. But I'm the first person who came along with this writing, and it's revolutionized what martial artists worldwide now um, are thinking about how the martial arts began and where it began. Okay. The word Nuba means? Yes. The Nuba are a group of people in Sudan, south to the, south to the area of Kemet, mm -hmm. better known as Egypt today. Mm -hmm. And it's from their culture, their society, and even actually earlier than Nuba, where the martial arts took refinement. Mm -hmm. And you find illustrations that are located on walls of tombs and temples in Kemet that show African people kicking, punching with weapons, etc. I mean, hundreds of illustrations. Exactly. Clearly, that's the beginning. Yes. Another text that you, that we have here today. Kempo. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about Kempo and mm. relationship also to this text, yes. which is this was the initial text. Yes. And then you produced and co wrote this piece. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about these two. All right. Championship Kempo was the first book written um, by African martial artists in this country. Prior to the time that this book was written, most books on the martial arts were written either by Asians or Europeans. Mm -hmm. There never has been a book until the arrival of Championship Kempo. I co-wrote this with two masters of the martial arts, Steve Sanders, now Steve Muhammad, mm -hmm. and Donnie Williams. Mm -hmm. Both of them have distinction of not only being co-founders of an organization that championed the rights of black martial artists in this country, the Black Rider Federation, but they were also seen in Bruce Lee's classic film, Into the Dragon. Okay. When Jim Kelly goes in to greet his instructors, those are the two gentlemen that he sees. Very good. Then I followed up with that, of course, with um, BKF Kempo, which was released this year. And if you see it, uh, it's definitely a book worth looking at. Absolutely. Studying. When I took a gander myself and I, I looked at that text as well as the others, there was information in there that was confirming like yes. the black madonna and the black buddha and the black buddha which i did not know that's right buddha meaning the enlightened one the enlightened but one. he was originally african black all the texts and the early paintings and statues of buddha were all uh, in fact dark in fact buddha was the first black liberator buddha was fighting the hindu system of caste oppression that the Aryan Europeans came down and colonized all of India by mm -hmm. and still keep today. Exactly. You talk about apartheid, has nothing on what goes on in, in uh, India mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. And Buddha was a black man who came up and said, we're going to fight this caste system, and that's the development of Buddhism. It is a reaction against Hinduism. That's Incredible. who Buddha was. Absolutely. Um, segwaying into Nigel Benz, the sculptor. Mm. Uh, you have a, a project that you're currently working on, Sons of Africa. Yes. Uh, the current project is David, Tree yes. of Life. Let's take a look at that. <laughs> this is actually a life-size piece. Uh, yes. Give us the dimensions of this, if you will. Ah, uh, it's about six feet tall, and I Can had a. Can we get in close on this, please? The interesting thing about the figure of David, and um, the whole idea of David, David from the biblical story of David and Goliath have been attempted by and, and actually executed by uh, four sculptors. My statue of David is the fifth. Um, but my figure of David, and it's pronounced David Etzahayim or David Tree of Life, my image of David is a bit unique because it is more um, ethnically precise. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the people in the Bible are African or black. And but they look Caucasian. They've been made to look occasion. So this now is the first time that you see us getting back to the reality of who the people in the Bible were. Mm -hmm. So David, at Zahayim, Tree of Life, the father of the Hebrew nation, is the first uh, subject in this particular series. Okay. I'm going to move forward. 
This mm. is a self-portrait. Yes, yes. Um, warrior man. Yes. But what do you call him? Well, um, I, I really don't have a full name for it yet, but it reflects the time. I like warrior man. <laughs> All right. Okay. And this is a current project that, you're, that is still uh, on the development board, if you will. Yes, yes. Tell yes. us a little bit uh, how we get from uh, point A to point B, if you will. In terms of the process? In terms of the process, yes. Well, um, uh, that may just stay with me as a trade secret. Okay, very for, good. Uh, for a for second. The, for the moment. <laughs> okay. I would okay. like to show the mother of humanity, yes. which is an absolute beautiful piece. Give the dimensions just to give us a sense of how big this thing is and where it's located mm. in Los Angeles. Uh, the Mother of Humanity is 16 feet tall, located at 109th Street, 10950 Central Avenue at a place called WLCAC in Watts. It weighs about two tons. It's the largest statue of a black woman in the world today. And it's a Los Angeles landmark. Absolutely. In many of the books and travel guides in L.A., you'll find that the Mother of Humanity is being represented now. There was one unique thing when I went to visit Mother is that she looks ethnically diverse in yes. her in her in her in her face yes uh, the eyes are clearly yes. Asian yes, yes. Uh, the nose and mouth uh, negroic yes. Yes. Uh, she has an Indian emblem here yes why is she international because we are international as black people okay we are the fathers and mothers of humanity of humanity yes. exactly very good and what do we have here uh, well these are a few um, of the miniature statues that I created for an award that was presented to Mr. Michael Jackson last year at Webster Hall. And this um, is made out of what, Nigel? They're made out of bronze. They're silver-plated bronze. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, it, it was part of an award called the 30th Anniversary Award. Exactly. And I presented that to Michael on behalf of fan clubs around the world. Many people don't know, by the way, that I created a, an award for Michael in 1990 that was given to him by Tommy Mottola his mortal enemy today. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, this was that award with Michael. Excellent. So. Can we capture that close up? Okay, we didn't have a closing. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a pleasure to have you here today. We've run out of time again. We're going to have Nigel back. This is one of a nine-part series. Nigel, it was absolutely a pleasure. Thank you, Terry. Thank it's you my so pleasure. much. Thank you. This was absolutely fabulous.